We talked about some powerful and memorable low tiers last video, so let's travel to the opposite spectrum. A lot of people will often write off top tiers as easy to use, cheap characters that carry bad players. And you know, that may be true. But that doesn't mean I can't appreciate fun characters who happen to be very powerful. Besides, who doesn't like being able to turn off their brain and click buttons with a character that can dominate the roster of their respective game? So join me as we look at the best top tiers in fighting games. Pet Shop is one of the most indisputed top tiers in fighting games ever. He spent the majority of Heritage for the Future's competitive lifespan soft banned and hailed as the definitive top 1 character, and it's pretty easy to see why once you actually play him. Between his insane mobility, his small hitbox making him hard to swat, and of course, his unblockables and insane damage. And because of this, he has one of the best matchup spreads, having at least a 7-3 against most of the roster and utterly invalidating both low tiers and even a few high tiers like Devo. However, in recent years, another character who was considered one of the best in the game has joined the band club and become notorious as one of the most powerful characters in any Capcom game ever. <laughs> Kakyoin was often considered the best character in the game next to Pet Shop for many years, but only recently have people made the decision to ban the character from tournaments, and there's a good reason for that. Kakyoin may not be as blatantly busted as Pet Shop, no unblockables or absurd flying movement, but he possesses such a strong kit that plays the game incredibly efficiently and makes him both an offensive and defensive powerhouse. The first big thing to point out in Heritage is the different types of characters. Due to the variety of different stands, various characters have different types of ways to control and operate them. Kakyoin's higher event green is an active stand, so upon using the S button to bring it out, you'll be able to control it independently and attack with it. While his stand is out, Kakyoin's moveset changes slightly, but being in stand mode also makes characters vulnerable to getting stand crash should you take too much damage. Active stand characters tend to be the strongest characters in the game. In fact, with the exception of Chaka, almost every high and top tier character in the game has some form of active stand, but Kakyoin takes this to a new level. Now by himself he packs decent normals and movement, but things get crazy when Hierophant is out. Besides getting access to a double jump, Kakyoin also, for whatever reason, has infinite air dashes while his stand is out. And yeah, it's as dumb as it sounds, especially since he already has great air normals that are useful for instant air dash setups. Kak's stand normals are a different level of absurd, his stand's long range gives him the best anti-air in the game and lots of incredibly strong pokes. This gives him great neutral and makes him one of the trickiest characters to play around, but despite how far they can hit, his normals are also very fast, so he's by no means disadvantaged during close quarters combat. His amazing projectile only makes him even more threatening at a long range. While it's mediocre without his stand, with this stand it becomes very strong for harassing enemies at a long range and will also beat out most other projectiles since it fires out 8 fireballs at once. Kakyoin's strongest tool though, is the net. Hierophant's field will place an invisible trap on the stage, which will entangle opponents and stun them for a small amount of time. The amount of utility this move gives Kakyoin almost makes you wonder if it was playtested. First of all, unlike Emerald Splash, this move is exactly the same whether or not Kak's stand is out. Like I said, the nets are invisible and last for almost half a minute, and Kak can place them at three different screen positions. They even force stand crashes, which usually requires landing numerous hits on a character while a stand is out. And they're invisible! Jesus, these things are crazy. Now technically if the opponent hits them with a stand normal, they can cut them down, but when Kak is on your ass firing projectiles and 50 50 you into oblivion, that's not exactly practical. These nets bring Kak's damage and mix-ups to another level, and they even provide good defensive support since they can interrupt combos and straight up shut down a lot of characters who can't cut them down such as Mariah and Young Joseph. Kak has a lot of bad supers, but his normals already do such good damage, and since he's an active stand, he can perform tandem combos, which are easy to set up and let him cash out big damage, allowing Kak to convert almost any hit into an easy TOD. So with great damage, abusable nets, good projectiles, defensive utility, and movement, what flaws does he actually have? Well, you'll probably have trouble finding matches in Fightgate, and you'll definitely get a lot of mean looks in friendly matches. Jokes aside, this character is just crazy, and his ridiculous tools give him excellent matchups, even against a lot of top tiers. In fact, he's one of the only characters who can actually challenge Pet Shop. His reputation as the best character in the game is certainly earned, as the character has ways to get around every situation he could be put into. Heritage for the Future mostly sees play on Fightgate, and he has a strong active player base with players like Pathetic, uh, that's his name, not an insult, 
and Mutastic repping the character, although due to the tournament ban, it's a bit difficult to find tournament results for him. By the way, in case you're curious, Fearless Kakyoin, who is a secret character in an alternate version of Normal Kak, is not considered anywhere near as strong as the OG due to having weaker defense and specials, not to mention being much harder to play, but he is still an incredibly strong character and a very viable fighter. Kakyoin fans just can't stop winning, other than, you know, his death in the manga. I didn't want to repeat games for this video, but I knew upon deciding to make them that I had to include my personal favorite character from Vampire Savior. This game is just too sick not to talk about, I'm sorry. In my low tiers video, I discussed Anacharis, a character regarded as the worst in the roster due to his lack of defensive options, but now we're going up the tier list to one of the best characters in the game, second only to Lord Raptor. I already mentioned how fast paced VSAV is, and Sasquatch is one of the poster childs for this rushdown based gameplay. Nothing is more indicative of the insanity of VSAV than a cracked out Sasquatch dashing across the screen into your face and high low mixing you to death. Sass's normals are fast, long range, and his magic series combos are some of the most effective on the roster, but his strengths truly begin to shine once you master his unique mobility option, the short hop. Like every other character, Sasquatch can dash by tapping forward or back twice in succession, but if you quickly tap the opposite direction after initiating the dash, Sass will cut the dash short. Short hops have little recovery, so by doing it efficiently, you can travel across the screen much faster than with standard dashes or a slow walk speed, but Sass can also input air normals during these hops. The ability to perform these normals so close to the ground gives him tons of unreactable high-low mix-ups. Once this character gets in, he can enforce one of the scariest vortexes upon the roster, constantly shifting between his mix-ups and his high damage chain combos. Toss in the throw, and suddenly he also has a very strong strike throw mix, which is nice as it can eliminate the threat of push block that can keep him out of the opponent's face. Now as a hyper-focused rushdown monster, you'd think Sass's main weakness would be getting in, but surprisingly that's not a major issue for the character. Sure, he can still get zoned out, especially because of his large size, but he also has access to big towers. By itself it's already a strong anti-air, but the ES version is a full screen wall of projectiles that will cause a knockdown upon hitting, and once the opponent is knocked down, Sasquatch can easily start moving in thanks to his speedy short hops. His EX moves, which are VSAB's equivalent of supers in case you didn't know, are solid as well, giving him access to a full screen beam that honestly is overshadowed by ES towers but is still generally good, and an unblockable puddle. Also the banana. Worthless super, but if you land this against someone, you know and they know that they lost the game. His biggest issues are his lack of defensive options, which is an issue magnified by his large hurt box, so he can definitely get shut down by good offense, but he can still escape pressure with solid use of his normals and big towers. Compared to his fellow top 2 contender, Lord Raptor, he's not nearly as well rounded, since Raptor has much better defensive options, but Sass is also much better as a starter character. He's easy to pick up and very simple to play at low levels. Thankfully, as players get better and better, Sasquatch remains effective thanks to his powerful mix ups, normals, high health, and big towers giving him a great neutral and defensive pivot option. He's racked up a strong player base with both Japanese representation from players like Haitani and Kawapa, and Americans like Yeti, Ghetto Slang, and Mr. Igloo, but the number one sass around the block is DD from Japan. These guys have been playing and optimizing the character's insane offense and defense, showing the world just how powerful Sasquatch is at the highest level. Plus, he's a ton of fun to play, and really, how can you not love this adorable fella? Melee Falcon do I even have to say anything else? Melee is a game that is full of sick characters that are a treat to watch, but no one embodies flashy destruction and utter swag more than Captain Falcon. Owing to his amazing dash and fast ground and air speed, Falcon's approach is one of the best in the game. He's a lightning bruiser with the ability to dance around the stage while enforcing powerful combos and devastating finishers. His combo game is flexible. He has tons of starters and can chase down anyone on any stage. His grab is relatively short range, but his up throw and down throw chain into each other and set up deadly tech chases and he can easily use them to combo into his amazing aerial normals. His neutral air is a fast two hit move that sends at a low horizontal angle and his back air and down air are both powerful for edge guarding, especially the latter as it's a meteor smash that can also lead to combos on the ground. All of these naturally flow to the forefront of the character's strengths, his forward air, the knee of justice. This move has two different hitboxes depending on when it connects. The weak hit is, as the name would suggest, rather weak, but it sends at a low angle that allows for easy follow-ups into the strong hit, which is one of the best moves in the game. 
Not only is it immensely powerful, it combos out of up throw, down throw, most of his aerials, it's just an excellent move that makes Captain Falcon incredibly dangerous. Despite being capable of buzzing around the screen thanks to his high speed, Falcon is also one of the heaviest characters in the game, so not only can he dish out plenty of punishment, but take it too. It's not uncommon to see Falcon live to over 120%, making him pretty hard to kill even if you can catch the fucker. His special moves have their utility, but unless he's recovering with down and up special or tech chasing with side special, he won't be using them a whole lot. Thankfully, it only makes his neutral special even more satisfying, a slow but powerful falcon punch that decimates anything it makes contact with. Is there anything more satisfying than seeing someone pop off after landing this sucker? Hit it after a successful knee, and you've just performed what the melee community refers to as the sacred combo. Falcon's Achilles heel is recovery, his fast falling speed is a double edged sword, enabling his combos but also making it harder for him to actually make it back to the stage. His up special is a command throw, so it gives him some protection, but it can't grab characters from hanging from the ledge, making him an easy target for edge hogging. This makes Falcon especially bad at recovering low, but thankfully, high recoveries are pretty easy thanks to a property on his down special. If used in the air after his second jump, the Falcon Kick will refresh his double jump. It's still a weakness though. Falcon is the king of player expression in Melee and is one of the coolest characters to come out of the series, be it his stylish combos, the awesome movement options like moonwalking, and his many slow moves that aren't very practical, but when they hit, the whole room can't help but bask in the hype. Falcon players have shown this, managing to consistently top 8 majors and show different ways to display the character's strengths. There's Hax, who plays a campy and more defensive game, although he dropped the character for Fox around 2014, Nun, who plays a hyper-aggressive style focused on tech chasing and punishes, and S2J, who is the master of stylish and efficient zero to deaths and excellent DI. In recent years, the character's results have slightly stagnated, as many prominent Falcon players are currently inactive, and the character struggles in matchups against a lot of other top and high tier characters, but he still has a long streak of strong tournament results across Melee's competitive history. It seems like every Smash game released after Melee has recognized how well this playstyle jives with players and attempted to recreate it, but Melee's version will always reign in my eyes as the absolute best incarnation of the character. Marvel 2 and 3 have so many iconic and fun top tiers to discuss, it's hard to narrow it down to just one. Everyone knows about how insane Sentinel and Storm in 2, or Zero, Virgil, and Morgan are in 3. MVC 2 and 3 were both incredibly successful competitive games, and plenty of people got to bear witness to how powerful those games' top tiers were. That's why I wanted to focus on one of the most interesting top tiers from a game in the series that a lot of people don't typically talk about. Marvel 1's not a game many people play, and even less people talk about it, but it's an interesting game for sure. The game's got a roster of 15 characters with their own strengths and weaknesses. But in order to expand the roster while reducing the amount of time and resources needed to create more original characters, Capcom decided to include 6 secret characters. With the exception of Roll, all of them were created by recoloring characters that already exist on the roster and slightly altering their movesets. For example, Shadow Lady is a clone of Chun-Li, but has different moves to resemble Shadow from Marvel Super Heroes vs. Street Fighter. The Capcom secret characters are actually pretty unique, but the Marvel ones are all strictly recolors with no moveset differences, instead having much different stats and attributes. Red Venom, for example, is the exact same character as Venom, but his speed is enhanced, giving him access to infinites at the cost of having his health drastically reduced. The character I want to talk about is the War Machine clone, Gold War Machine. War Machine is already an excellent character in MVC1, thanks to his high damage, flight command special, and myriad of projectiles. He also has a set of very strong supers that make him a solid force on any team. As a clone of the original War Machine, Gold War Machine keeps all these aspects intact, but with some… key differences. Well, for one, his projectile attacks use missiles instead of lasers, and the missiles tend to have better hitboxes. More importantly, however, Gold War Machine's most distinct trait is his PERMANENT hyper armor. From the minute the match begins until things come to an end, War Machine will not flinch against any attack. No, I'm not making that up. This isn't some Mugen character or anything. This is a real fighting game character. Goldie can tank anything, and I do mean anything. This creates numerous issues for the opponent, chief among them being that he's nearly impossible to combo since he can't be put into hit stun. Marvel 1 has so many infinites and crazy combos, and Goldie does not have to worry about any of that thanks to his armor. He simply walks through it while continuing to pressure or zone with his powerful projectiles. 
Yet that wasn't enough, he also has the highest vitality in the game, so he can take lots of punishment. He can be thrown, but good luck doing that when he's constantly throwing out insane normals and projectiles. Gold War Machine gets even more powerful when using assists. Marvel 1's assist system is unique as you can choose from one of many different character assists as opposed to other characters on your team doing them. The best assist is universally considered to be Colossus. Insane priority, full screen range, multi-hitting, and best of all, it can be used 5 times. With this powerful assist, Goldie can push characters off him or contribute to his block pressure, which is only made stronger by the fact that actually getting out of it is so hard. You can't poke your way out of his pressure because he'll simply ignore it, so actually fighting him requires you to play a slow, methodical hit and run approach. You have to make every hit count against him and you can't overextend, otherwise he'll easily overwhelm you. Goldie only gets better when considering his team synergy, especially with himself. Gold War Machine plus regular War Machine is in the running for the best team in the game, and there's little that these two can't do together. Besides their high damage, stamina, range, and being able to play two of the best characters on one team, they work remarkably well in regards to crossover combinations. Whenever you have Meter in MBC1, you can initiate a crossover, which will place both your characters on screen at the same time. During these crossovers, you have infinite meter, so naturally the best strategy is to spam the living shit out of your hyper combos. Both War Machines have two of the best supers in the game in Proton Cannon, a full screen laser beam or volley of missiles for gold, and War Destroyer, which rains missiles down on the enemy, so imagine how powerful they are when used at the same time in succession. Two War Machines can decimate life bars, and even if they can't land a solid hit, they can still get tons of damage through chip damage. With how fast they can build meter, these two can decide matches incredibly quick through smart use of the combination. So even though he's a little slow, Gold War Machine is an iron wall that hits hard and provides the best defensive value in the game while also being a great team player. So uh, what's the major weakness? It can't just be his lack of speed, right? Oh. Hmm. Yeah, Gold War Machine cannot block. Even though this sounds like a nail in the coffin, Goldie doesn't really have to worry about it because of his armor and high health, but should you play careless, you can get overwhelmed by strong enough offense and he gets shut down especially hard by supers that can lock him down with high hits done, putting him at a disadvantage against other top tiers like Strider and Wolverine. This character is blatantly unfair though, and had Marvel 1 reached the level of competitive success its successors did, I would not be surprised at all if the son of a bitch was banned, he's comparable to a boss character honestly. Next up is possibly the most obscure character on the list, but also one with an incredibly interesting origin. Mortal Kombat Trilogy is a very fucking odd game. While a lot of casual players consider it just another version of Mortal Kombat 3, most top players treat it much, much differently. Sure enough, despite having many similarities to Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3, Trilogy also has a lot of differences that make it its own game, both in regards to the roster as well as many mechanical and system differences. Now the character I want to discuss requires me to talk about some of the very interesting developmental history so allow me to divulge. There are technically two versions of Mortal Kombat Trilogy that exist. The one most people know is commonly referred to as the PlayStation version, as most people experienced it on that console but it was also ported to the Sega Saturn and the PC. This is the version that contains all the content people know and is generally the most popular version of the game, but another version of the game was released for the N64. Due to the N64 being a cartridge based system, the port of Mortal Kombat Trilogy had to be cut down to fit onto the format and is missing numerous characters and stages as a result. This resulted in the version of the character that I want to discuss today, Sub-Zero, but I've still got some explaining to do so bear with me. In the original Mortal Kombat, the first Sub-Zero, Bi Han, was killed and his younger brother Kawhi Leong took his place under the same name in Mortal Kombat 2. For the original Mortal Kombat 3, Kawhi Leong returned with a new design, removing the mask and gaining a new scar as a result of his defection from his clan. However, for Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3, a new version of Sub-Zero known as Classic with a K Sub-Zero was added that also had the iconic mask and used moves from Mortal Kombat 2 and 1. For Mortal Kombat Trilogy, both Sub-Zeros carried over to the PS1 version, but in order to save space for the N64 port, the two were condensed into one character. This character has all the special moves of both Sub-Zeros, making for one of the most insane versions of the character in Mortal Kombat history. In Mortal Kombat Trilogy, character normals tend to be very similar amongst characters with similar models. In Sub's case, he shares normals and combos with the male ninja body type, and this body type tends to have quite insane combos thanks to the fact that they possess a launcher, which allows for very high damage follow-ups, which is only helped by Sub's special moves. 
As I mentioned, he has the specials of both Sub-Zeros. To surmise this, it means he has the Freeze Blast, a straight projectile, the Ice Puddle, which is unblockable, Ice Clone, which can be performed in the air or the ground, and Ice Shower, which fires upwards and comes back down, with two different variations that modify the trajectory. All of these moves freeze the enemy on contact, so comboing into them gives Sub access to easy damage and resets. Sub's plethora of specials gives him the tools for almost any situation. The clones and the puddle dominate neutral, allowing him to control the flow of the match while enforcing the constant threat of getting frozen and giving him easy punishes against reckless play. The ice showers gives him very strong Oki that allows him to create strong pressure and assault enemies from long distances, and the slide is both a combo ender and a fast load that can catch opponents off guard. Clones can punish sweeps and low kicks, meaning he can keep himself covered if the opponent attempts to poke out of his pressure, and he's just as good at staying full screen and spamming ice showers as he is at rushing down and emptying health bars with combos. The best thing about Sub is how easily his offense chains into itself. His Oki with ice showers and puddles lets him perfectly set up his opponents after combos, letting him loop his offense and, no pun intended, snowball his opponent into terrible situations that more often than not lead to death. N64 Trilogy is a very difficult game to research, being the least played version of a game that is already not super common, but most people agree that this N64 Super Sub-Zero is a top 5 character. The combination of movesets did a lot to augment this character, and he's easily the best version of the character that the MK series has ever seen. Well, we've seen all kinds of absurd tricks, gimmicks, and kits throughout this video, so let's end on something more simple. The last character we'll be looking at is none other than Sagat from Capcom vs SNK2. As I've been doing for this video so far, I think it's important to explain the game's systems before talking about how they contribute to Sagat's strength. CVS2 is a very odd game with a mishmash of different systems from different games. There's a team system, a ratio system, and of course, the six character defining grooves. The team and ratio system work as you'd expect. You can pick up to three characters and then divide their strength differently depending on the team size, with the total strength equaling up to four. Most people tend to play teams of three since it gives you the most amount of health bars to work with. The grooves on the other hand are much more intricate. There are six of them, the CAP grooves designed after various Capcom games and the SNK grooves that are based on SNK's library. Each group is very, very different and almost completely reshapes how the characters play, and as you'd expect, different characters are strong in different grooves. For example, characters like Blanca, Bison, and Sakura are considered at their strongest in A group, which enables the Street Fighter Alpha 2 custom combo. So it might not surprise you to learn that the best character in the game is strong across every groove. Sagat is the king of CVS2 and has literally everything you could want to play this game efficiently. Sagat has godlike neutral, amazing damage, and is astoundingly versatile. Sagat's a big guy, and of course, that means big normals. His standing light kick and crouch light kick are both lightning fast, but his most feared buttons are his standing and crouching heavy punch, owing to their range, damage, and ability to cancel into specials as well as their anti-air potency. It should be noted that Sagat heavies shouldn't be spammed as they have slow startup and can be interrupted, but thanks to his assortment of faster pokes, he can easily assault you without having to commit to a slower button. Tiger shots are solid projectiles, but there are a lot of fireball counters on the roster, so fireball zoning isn't as powerful here as it would be in other Sagat incarnations. So he'll most often be using Tiger Uppercut, which is an insanely high range anti-air and good damage combo ender, as well as Tiger Knee, which fulfills similar roles while allowing him to traverse the screen at a different pace. His supers are also very strong, acting as wonderful reversals and great damage. He gives a very fast projectile with high and low variations that end as combo enders, and Tiger Raid, which is a good anti-air. All these strengths lead to Sagat being a base strong character, but what really seals the deal on his power is how groove friendly he is. Groove choice is almost non-existent for Sagat. He works well in all of them, and it means he can use all the game's mechanics well, while also acting as a strong partner for every character in the game. No matter what groove you choose, Sagat can be a partner to the other characters on your team. K-Groove is his best groove, and K-Groove Sagat is considered far and away the strongest character in the game. K-Groove focuses on a rage meter that builds as you take damage. Once the rage meter is filled, Sagat's already incredible damage goes up even higher. To call Sagat and K-Groove scary would be the understatement of the year. Just one Sagat heavy punch can chop through a fourth of your health depending on the character and ratio, and his supers become devastating. In addition, the universal SNK groove mobility options of running and short hopping give Sagat some of the best pressure in the game, as he can create highly ambiguous mix-ups with how low to the ground he can jump. It's obviously not on some V-Sav Sasquatch short hop shit, but if you're not paying attention, you might find yourself taking a few too many overheads. 
Seagrew Sagat is close behind, trading Kgrew's more offensive meter usage for a plethora of defensive options, including alpha counters and rolls. Sagat's roll isn't great, and he doesn't have much use for roll cancelling, which is an advanced technique that allows you to transfer the invincibility of a roll into a special move, which is incredibly powerful, but he doesn't get much utility out of it. Still, it's nice to have, and Seagroove also generally has access to more meter at any given point in time, so he sees more use out of his supers than Kgroove. He can also make up for the damage differential thanks to Seagroove's unique ability to cancel level 2 supers into specials or level 1 supers, so he can cash out with tons of meter for a big reward. The other four groups proved to be strong for him, but definitely not to the level of K and C. N, P, S, he's good in all of them, and he can make use of all of their unique mechanics, be it N Groove's max mode giving him increased damage, or P Groove letting him use parries for some extra defense. A Groove is probably his weakest groove, as he just doesn't get a lot of help from the custom combo, but he's still a fantastic character here, which should say a lot about how inherently strong he is. Sagat's player base reflects this versatility. While plenty of Sagats like Bochan, Towel, and Kiku use either C or K, there's tons of other Groove players that manage to make Sagat work because of his versatility, like Azumi who primarily uses S Groove and P Rugal who uses P Groove. Mr. Coinflakes is a beast, but he does have his share of issues, chief among them being his tall size, making him liable to getting rushed down, and his slow speed, but really that's all just nitpicking. CVS2 Sagat's biggest issue is that you can't run three of him on one team. He's ridiculous. No two ways around it. So that's all the top tiers I wanted to discuss today. While they're obviously considered very powerful, it's interesting to note that they tend to be much more simple than characters on the lower end of the roster. This isn't always true, but of course, it's fun to talk about what makes these characters vary in strength and viability. Who are your favorite top tiers? Let me know in the comments down below. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to leave a like and subscribe and hit the notification bell to keep up with my content. Thank you for watching, have a wonderful night, take care.